Okay, we are live. All right, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Wes Glinsman. I'm the Executive Director of the Oklahoma State Medical Association. Uh, we're so glad you were able to, able to join us today for our discussion on a very important and timely topic on SARS-CoV-2 and the medical licensure and regulation. Our guest speaker today is Dr. Hank Chaudhry, who is the President and CEO of the Federation of State Medical Boards since 2009. Just a couple of housekeeping notes before we get started. First and foremost, we'd like to say thank you to our other presenting sponsors who've made today's CME possible. A big thank you to PLICO and to the Oklahoma State Board of Medical Licensure and Supervision. I'd also like to thank our CME manager, Sandy Deba, our IT manager, Sharon Westmoreland, and our communications manager, Jennifer Dennis-Smith, for helping pull this all together today. Information about how to receive your CME credit can be found on our website at okmed.org. You can also find copies of today's presentation and more information about our speaker there as well. So with that, we'll begin today's formal presentation. What we plan to do is have Dr. Chaudhry make his presentation and then hopefully we'll have some time for questions at the end. Uh, if you do have questions, please type them in the chat section on the YouTube page. Uh, please note that this chat function will only be live during the event, but then what we'll do is time permitting, we'll try to get to as many of those questions at the end as we can uh, at the conclusion of our presentation. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started. A uh, quick disclaimer, the faculty, the OSMA CME Planning Committee, the reviewer and the moderator have no relevant financial relationships to disclose. And the OSMA CME manager has reviewed all information and resolved any conflicts of interest if applicable. So with that, it is my honor to introduce Lyle Kelsey, who is the executive director for the Oklahoma State Board of Medical Licensure and Supervision. Uh, the Oklahoma State Board of Medical Licensure licenses and supervises the professions of medical doctors and 14 other categories of healthcare professionals in the state. He also serves as administrators for two separate health professional licensing boards uh, for podiatry and perfusionists. In 2002, Mr. Kelsey was recognized as one of the 20 certified medical board executives nationwide by the Federation of State Medical Boards. Professionally, he recently served on the board of directors for the Federation and previously completed a two-year term as president of the Administrators in Medicine organization, comprised of the 70 executive directors of state medical and osteopathic boards. So with that, uh, good afternoon, Mr. Kelsey, and I will turn the floor over to you. Thank you very much, Wes. appreciate everybody uh, dialing in for this. Uh, uh, I think it's gonna be an excellent presentation. When uh, Sandy Deba and Wes told me that they had secured uh, Hank Chaudhry as the speaker, I, I just insisted that I introduce him. Uh, Hank and I have become good friends over the last 11 years as he's been CEO of the Federation. And uh, I just, uh, you, you'll be in for a treat. He's a, he's a great individual besides a great speaker. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll give a little background about uh, Dr. Hank uh, Chaudhry, uh, osteopathic physician. He's been the president and CEO of the Federation of State Medical Boards since October of 2009, I always like to remind him that I was on the search committee uh, that interviewed him and a strong support for hiring him and he has not let us down. The Federation represents all state medical licensing boards in the United States. And he also co-manages the United States Medical Licensing Examination, most of you know as the USMLE, with the National Board of Medical Examiners along with maintaining a Federation Credentials Verification Service. Um, many of you may take advantage of that, FCBS, for physicians and physician assistants. Dr. Chaudhry served as chair of the International Association of Medical Regulatory Authorities uh, that we refer to as IAMRA, which uh, represents more than 118 member organizations in more than 48 nations. From 2016 to 2018, he was directly involved in that organization, still is to this day. He's a graduate of New York University, New York Institute of Technology, College of Osteopathic Medicine, and Harvard School of Public Health. Dr. Chaudhry completed an internship at St. Barnabas Hospital and an ACGME accredited residency in internal medicine at New York University Winthrop uh, Hospital, where he was chief medical resident. Dr. Chaudhry was an assistant dean and chair of medicine at uh, the New York College of Medi Osteopathic Medicine from 2001 to 2007 and spent 14 years with the United States Air Force Reserve rising to the rank of major. 
He also served as flight surgeon attached to the 732nd Airlift Squadron at McGuire Air Force Base. Dr. Chaudhry is the author and co-author of more than 75 peer-reviewed medical journal articles. And he's also author and co-author of two books, one, The Fundamentals of Clinical Medicine, fourth edition, and the second one, Medical Licensing and Discipline in America. Dr. Chaudhry, so what a pleasure to have you with us today. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Lyle. I really appreciate that kind introduction. And thank you to Wes and thank you to Dr. Monks of the OSMA for inviting me. I'm delighted to be with you all. I'm sorry I can't be with you in person, uh, but uh, virtual is what we're gonna have to do for at least a few more months. Uh, we'll see how long this goes, but delighted to talk to you about obviously a very pertinent topic, but specific to medical licensure and regulation. Trying to advance my slide, give me a second here. There we go. So in terms of my disclosures, um, as Lyle mentioned, Mr. Kelsey mentioned, I am a full-time employee of the FSMB. Um, I'm a member of the Harvard Health Policy and Management Executive Council and a member of the AMA and the AOA as well. So of course, when we talk about a virus or a pandemic, uh, viruses may come and go and they're all relatively new when we're dealing with them, but pandemics obviously are not new. We've for a number of years, uh, we've had at the national level plans for all sorts of viruses. Uh, a lot of this began around 2005, because if you remember your history back in 2003 was when we had a outbreak of SARS, um, which was due to a coronavirus, not the same coronavirus we're dealing with today, but it was something that almost became a full-blown pandemic in many continents, but it was able to be successfully contained. But it gave a lot of people in public health at the world, national, and state level uh, some anxiety. And so they started preparing for what would we do should there be an emergency. And so in 2009, uh, that's me. I was health commissioner on Long Island in Suffolk County, New York, a county of about a million and a half people. Uh, we had a fairly large health department. It was actually the ninth largest local health department in the country. Uh, with about 1,600 employees and a budget of $400 million. And early on, when we had H1N1, which is a, a type of influenza um, outbreak, and that particular virus began in Mexico, um, even before it was declared a pandemic, which didn't happen till June, there was anxiety about what to do with this new virus. And I mentioned that is because every time there is a new virus, you really don't know how it will behave, and therefore you don't always know in the beginning how to manage it. So in the beginning, the CDC's guidelines, which we all followed at the state and the local level, was that if you get a cluster of cases among children, it's a good idea to shut down schools. Back then, there were a cluster of cases in California, in Texas, and in New York, we suddenly started seeing some cases, and sure enough, um, just before May the 3rd, we had a cluster of cases that tested positive for this new H1N1 influenza virus. And so consistent with the CDC guidelines, we closed down this school district in Deer Park, New York, which had 5,000 students. Um, the person on the podium is the county executive for Suffolk County, and we made that announcement, and the school remained shut for about five full school days. Now, by the end of that week, the CDC changed its guidance. And the reason it did that was because of emerging information. So the new guidance was that if you have a cluster of cases, you don't need to shut down schools. That was helpful. And we implemented that modification as quickly as we got it from the CDC. So one memory I have of back then is there was a pretty close coordination between the county health departments, the state health departments, and the CDC in particular. Uh, now, back then, uh, we really feared that that H1N1 influenza would be the big one. The big one that we all worried about was the 1918 influenza pandemic, which is to this day known as the great influenza pandemic because of the number of individuals who got it and the number of individuals who died. And so this is a snapshot from a World Health Organization meeting on May the 18th, just two weeks after we shut down that school district in New York. And you can see everyone's really worried about 
what are we going to do if this becomes a problem? Now, in some places like Japan, because they had had the SARS cases back in uh, 2003 or so, uh, a lot of the people on their own started wearing masks. And some health authorities recommended masks as well. But it wasn't clear that masks were necessary. That's why you may not remember wearing a mask back in 2009, because that wasn't part of the guidance. It wasn't felt at that point for that particular virus that that was what was going to be needed. But in places like Japan and parts of China, where they were extra nervous that this could be uh, the big one, they on their own started wearing masks. Fast forward to uh, 2019, we have the SARS coronavirus 2. It is a SARS type virus. It's a coronavirus, but it's called a novel coronavirus because it's new. That's where the word novel comes in. And while this is a scanning electron microscopic uh, uh, colorized picture, it's really quite amazing if you think about it that those yellow particles that are colorized yellow in this picture, that little particle is about one one thousandth of the diameter of a human hair. Amazing how that one tiny particle, how much damage it can do all across the world essentially. Uh, the National Academy of Medicine, um, which is based in Washington, D.C., just had its annual meeting a couple of weeks ago, and their experts pointed out that what we know right now is that this particular virus that we're dealing with right now more than likely began in a bat. Uh, we're not sure if there was another species of animal involved. Uh, the Malayan pangolin looks like an um, aardvark or an anteater might be involved. It's not clear. Uh, but there may be an intermediate species. There's some question. They're still studying and looking into it. But the big issue for any of these viruses, and many of these are zoonotic viruses, meaning they begin in animals. The problem occurs is when these viruses transfer from an animal to a human. But even then, it doesn't necessarily raise alarms until that same virus develops human-to-human -human transmission. And that's exactly what happened with this virus uh, at the end of 2019. It's exactly the same thing that happened with the SARS coronavirus back in 2003. It happened with so many viruses in the last few years. It happened with something called the MERS. Now, some of you may have heard of the MERS virus, the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome virus. Uh, that also began with bats, but the intermediate animal was a camel. So any number of animals can harbor these viruses and on occasion, they mutate enough so that they can transfer to a human, but we don't get worried as much in public health until it becomes human to human transmission. Now, some of you may have read in the news this past week that Denmark has reported um, that they have isolated a type of a coronavirus uh, that may be transmissible to humans uh, in minks. And because they're concerned about human to human transmission, they have decided to cull that population. That is not an unusual, unusual approach to managing uh, these types of viruses. Um, it actually happened uh, a decade ago in Hong Kong with chickens that became infected with a type of an influenza virus that people worried would lead to human to human transmission. Again, sometimes these don't make the news, the front page of the news, but uh, their, their approaches to managing these types of conditions that public health officials are very aware of. Now, let me take a moment to talk about the classification of these viruses. Um, there's been a change over the years, and we're moving away from naming viruses based upon uh, some characteristic about them or where they originated. Uh, I'll give you a good example. The 1918 uh, great influenza that I just referred to is also sometimes known as the Spanish flu or the Spanish influenza. And some of you who know your history know that uh, that's actually could be a misnomer um, because what happened was back in 1918, we had World War I and most of the countries in Europe were obviously engaged in combat. It turned out Spain was neutral in that conflict. And so uh, the Spanish press was free to report on anything and everything. And so they reported on uh, the extent of the 1918 virus all over Europe and all over the world. And that's the news that we would hear about in the US even before it became a problem in America. And so over time, people just assumed that because they were getting the news from Spain, 
that it must have been the Spanish influenza. And that's how that name began. But we're moving away from this. And there are many diseases. Many of you are familiar with West Nile virus. Um, it's named for the river in Africa, but uh, obviously it's now a virus that's endemic, meaning it's all over the United States and we get it every year in all the continental states of the US. Other things are like the Ebola virus is also named after a river in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, but this particular virus, as I say, is a SARS type virus, a coronavirus. And in this classification, this is called the Baltimore classification of viruses. Uh, Baltimore is not named after the capital of Maryland. It's actually named after David Baltimore, a Nobel uh, Prize winning um, biologist uh, from America who came up this classification. And as you can see, there is a slight distinction between the coronavirus, which is in the fourth category from the left, and the influenza virus, which is uh, just one category over in the same category as measles, Ebola, and rabies. All of these are messenger RNA type viruses that lead to reproduction of the virus through a translation machinery involving proteins. Now let's turn back the clock a little bit. Hard to believe this is only about 11 months ago, but at the end of December, December 31st, uh, this is a slide from Johns Hopkins University. Uh, there were only a total that we know of, there were probably more, but these are what we know of. There were 27 cases of this new novel virus. That's why this virus is called COVID-19. The 19 refers to the year in which this virus was isolated. Um, and again, because there had been animal to human spread and documented human to human spread, there was a real concern that this could spread. And so the efforts certainly of the Chinese health authorities were to try to contain it as best they can. Um, one thing they did do is within another week or two of this uh, date, they put together the genome, the genetic analysis of what this virus looks like, shared it with the World Health Organization, which then immediately began putting together a test for it. Um, the CDC did the same, and you may have heard there were some delays in that test because the initial test had some flaws in it. But certainly by the end of January, early February, most of the world had access to a test to test for this virus. Now, this is a big change from 1918 when we didn't even know that this was a virus. Viruses had not yet been discovered. In 1918, um, all people knew was that there's something out there that's causing this kind of illness. In fact, that's where the, the term influenza comes from. It's from you know, centuries ago when no one really knew uh, why certain large numbers of people died every year and they felt that this was due to an influence of the air. Uh, and that's where we get the term influenza uh, because this is way before the viruses were identified. But fast forward to today, not only um, do we have a test for this virus um, and the number of tests being put together that are more rapid, we're also looking at obviously a vaccine, which obviously we couldn't do back in 1918. Now, initially, uh, these are two important public health terms that we used to try to address a new infection. You may have heard of these because these have been in the news and you may have gotten this in your training as well, containment and mitigation. Containment is what you try to do to try to limit the spread of a particular virus. You do it through quarantine, you do it through lockdowns, you do it through testing, um, and then contact tracing to make sure you know of who else might be infected to try to limit the spread of that virus. Mitigation are measures you put in place when the disease actually goes beyond containment, it's actually surpassed containment. And that's where travel restrictions, hand hygiene, school closures, social distancing, and depending on the virus, facial coverings and masks come into play. Now, I remember vividly um, at the, it was the first weekend of March, um, seems like such a long time ago, but uh, uh, on one of the Sunday shows, I heard uh, the Surgeon General, Jerome Adams, uh, make a comment that really caught my attention. Um, Dr. Adams said that, well, you know, we've been doing our best in the US to try to contain this virus, but uh, I'm afraid we're gonna have to shift to mitigation. And I remember the people who were questioning him just sort of moved on to the next question. But for those of us in public health, that was an eye opener because that implies that it could be everywhere. And sure enough, on one of the other Sunday shows that same day, uh, Dr. Fauci uh, from the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases said the same thing, that the nation is gonna have to move toward mitigation. Well, that got me 
uh, anxious and worried. And so uh, at the FSMB, the Federation of State Medical Boards, we knew that the first case, in the, and this might be a busy slide, uh, you don't have to read each word, uh, but I'll sort of show you some of the highlights of the timeline of our response at the Federation of State Medical Boards on behalf of medical boards like Oklahoma and many others. We knew that the first case was confirmed in the US in Washington state in January 21st. Uh, we created a task force called the Ad Hoc Task Force on Pandemic Preparedness even before it was declared a pandemic. And this was at the end of February because I just had a feeling this might become something to worry about. Uh, Washington state became actually the very first state to declare a state of emergency in the US. That happened on February the 29th. On March the 10th, we canceled all non-essential travel by board members and staff and many of your organizations and uh, may have done the same. And it wasn't until March 11th that the World Health Organization declared a worldwide pandemic because the virus by that point had spread throughout many different continents. Um, again, I'm not gonna read through every word of this, but the FSMB was in touch with the Department of Health and Human Services. We were in touch with the Coronavirus Task Force. Um, I was personally in touch with Dr. Burks, uh, Deborah Burks, for example, um, and we began exchanging information. One of the concerns that the federal government had was, uh, what are the states doing uh, to try to ease access to care? And so the, one of the things the Federation was doing was providing data about who is licensed, who is uh, available uh, to help, because by then HHS had changed some of the regulations to allow telemedicine and to allow the cross state practice of medicine, something we don't ordinarily do, but the states were willing to do because of this national emergency. And of course, by then, every single state and territory in the US had declared a public health emergency, allowing them to make those kinds of modifications. So this is a good summary slide of what the states did um, in response to COVID-19, 45 states uh, modified their medical licensing requirements uh, or the renewals to allow for out-of-state healthcare professionals who wanted to help out as a volunteer or even if they had practice um, uh, ability uh, to do that. Um, and some states even said, look, we don't even have time to register you folks. If you want to help out, go ahead and do so. Just try to stay out of trouble. 42 states did that for telemedicine. And you know, by then, CMS had also made some changes in what would qualify for reimbursement. The state boards do not get involved in uh, reimbursement issues, but that was obviously an important piece so that those physicians who were delivering care through telemedicine could do so through um, you know, getting some reimbursement for their efforts. 33 states at least um, expedited licensure for retired physicians or inactive physicians. Now, this was not necessarily to go to the front lines and help. It also allowed these folks to help by manning the phones in hospitals and health systems, answering questions of worried patients and relatives, maybe even helping out with contact tracing. So I don't want you to think that suddenly retired physicians were at the front lines. Um, it really depended upon the qualifications of the individual and what the individual wanted to do. And I know our colleagues in nursing and pharmacy did similar things. Some of you may be familiar with our Interstate Medical Licensure Compact. I'll talk about that in a few moments. Um, it says 29, but 30 states are now part of the Interstate Medical Licensure Compact. Oklahoma is one of them, and I'll talk about that in a bit. And of course, you may have heard 11 states allowed fourth-year medical students to graduate early from MD and DO schools so that they could help out as well. It was really an all-hands-on-deck situation. Related to CME, um, as you can see from this slide, 31 states uh, issued some sort of waivers on CME. Uh, three states don't have any CME requirements, Colorado, Montana, and South Dakota. And I know from our, uh, from Mr. Kelsey from the Oklahoma Medical Board, and I believe the osteopathic board did the same. They did uh, waive during the course of the emergency, some of the requirements related to pain management and MAT uh, content specific CME. But this was again, an, an effort by the state boards to recognize that in the middle of a pandemic, um, you know, it, it may not be easy for people uh, to be able to engage in CME activities, certainly not in person. And I know many of the CME communities started to deliver virtual CME programming. Um, Lyle mentioned the USMLE exam that we're involved with and our partner um, organization, the National Board of Osteopathic Medical Examiners. Uh, they have their Comlex USA examination for osteopathic physicians. Both of these exams, because they use the same platform, the Prometric Test Centers, because of the pandemic, for several weeks, the Prometric test centers were uh, shut down. 
because there was a worry about the spread of the virus. And so the USMLE and the Comlex USA were not administered for an extended period of time. Um, ultimately, those computer-based portions of those exams came back online, but for the USMLE, the step two clinical skills exam for which we want examinees to be tested with human standardized patients in one of five um, cities where we have these test centers, we have extended that suspension. So that's gonna go through probably sometime in 2021 because we felt in the middle of a pandemic, it didn't make sense to have people traveling all over the world, uh, all, over, all over the country to be engaging in that kind of assessment. Um, and I believe the Comlex USA folks have done similar things by extending that suspension most recently. The other thing that happened was that many of the state boards, this is a slide from New York State, but many states did this, uh, modified their open meeting laws. Many states have this in the interest of transparency, but many of the states could not have meetings of their board or all of various uh, organizations uh, virtually. And so some of the laws had to be changed. And so Governor Cuomo in New York extended his executive order to allow virtual meetings of the New York Board of Medicine, for example, and this happened all over the country. Again, something that had never been thought about before, but the pandemic sort of forced the issue. Now, there have been some pros and cons. Some folks like being able to have these meetings virtually because those who serve on these committees don't have to travel. People among the public can listen in without having to travel to these meetings as well, um, but not everyone has internet. Uh, and certainly that's a concern in the rural parts of our country. So I'm not sure what will happen after the pandemic, but we'll have to see. Telemedicine, telehealth certainly took off. I'm sure there are people in the audience who are listening to this among physicians who, for the first time, decided to engage in using telehealth and telemedicine in ways perhaps that they hadn't before. Well, we certainly saw uh, an increase in that. And this is quite an amazing graph if you think about it, because for a period of time, when places like New York had their epicenter, uh, for about a month and a half or two months, there were actually more telehealth visits in the United States than there were office visits. That's really quite remarkable because um, we saw this happen not just on the provider side, we also saw this on the patient side. And of course, HHS made this easy. They modified the HIPAA requirements so you could use Skype, for example, uh, you could use your iPhone to engage in telemedicine because it was felt that access to care was important and some care through technology was obviously better than no care. Now, of course, you can't do all care through telemedicine and technology. If you have chest pain at three o'clock in the morning, that's not the time to turn on your iPhone and, and use telemedicine. That's the time to call 911. And so this also in, entailed educating patients about what it means and when to use telehealth and when not to use telehealth. Health. And of course, sadly, and I think you all know this, partly because of the pandemic, many people who are having strokes or heart attacks did not show up, uh, did not call 911, did not use telemedicine, did not show up at the hospital and passed away uh, from those conditions because we definitely saw a drop off in ER admissions for things like chest pain and stroke, for example. So the big question I get a lot is what are the state boards going to do after the pandemic is over? Well, to be honest, right now the state boards are focused on what's going on right now during the pandemic, but we are beginning to look at, you know, what may be permissible after the pandemic is over. The key will be, do the benefits outweigh the harms? And I will tell you that uh, the state boards, we just did a survey at the FSMB of the state boards, and a number of them reported that patients, some patients have complained about telemedicine and telehealth, that it hasn't been exactly what they intended um, and there have been some mistakes and errors made uh, and some shortcuts perhaps also where, you know, it's our firm belief at the FSMB on behalf of our state boards that telemedicine is still the practice of medicine. So that doesn't mean you can prescribe just because somebody tells you their diagnosis over the phone or tells you what their complaint is. You are, you, we feel very strongly and we have a policy on this that it's available on our website, fsmb.org, that if you're using telemedicine as a physician, you, you better do a complete history of present illness. You better check your past medical history, past surgical history, allergies, um, try to do a review of systems as best you can, and using devices, do the best you can with a physical exam uh, before you come up with your differential diagnosis. And I think that's an important piece to keep in mind. Telemedicine is a great thing, but it does not mean it's a shortcut to the delivery of care. So we'll have to see how that sorts out. 
but I have been in touch with the telemedicine industry, the American Telemedicine Association, for example, um, and we all agree that if telemedicine and telehealth is to prevail and succeed even after the pandemic, then uh, they will have to prove that they are a safe means to deliver some types of care. Um, and I think that's gonna be important to keep in mind. I mentioned the Interstate Medical Licensure Compact, so let me talk about that a little bit. This slide is already out of date because this is a dynamic situation. 29 states, now 30 states, have actually passed this into law. So Louisiana in light blue is now a dark red color. The dark red, sorry, the dark blue color um, is not a political statement. The dark blue color refers to uh, which of the states have adopted uh, this interstate medical licensure compact into law. The light blue states are the ones that have had hearings on this. And certainly there's been a lot of interest during the pandemic and um, we'll see where this goes. But what the Interstate Medical Licensure Compact is, and Oklahoma, as you see, is a member of this, is these states who have signed on to this compact have agreed that if a physician, MD or DO, meets nine criteria, that's it, nine criteria, these participating states are ready, willing, and able to instantly issue a license to practice medicine, not just telemedicine, the full practice of medicine, as long as physicians meet those nine criteria. And I'll share the criteria in my next slide, but according to the FSMB, we believe 80% um, of the nation's physicians should be able to meet those nine criteria to get this license, to get multiple licenses if they want to. Not every physician has more than one license. Most physicians will spend their entire career with just one license, but for those who want to deliver care to neighboring states or those who want to uh, get involved in telemedicine, this may be uh, an option. Now, of course, you still have to pay the licensing fees for each of the states where you want to practice medicine. But remember, those fees allow the state boards to function to address complaints when they come up. But that also means due process, making sure that if there is a complaint against the physician, that there is a means at place uh, to make sure that the state boards thoughtfully study the complaint investigate the complaint and make the right decision related to the complaint. And that's part of what the fee is all about. Uh, but what are those nine criteria? So these are the nine criteria. I'm not gonna read every one, but again, 80% of the nation's physicians in our view should be able to meet these criteria to be eligible for multiple licenses through the Interstate Medical Licensure Compact. Now, what if you're a physician in that 20%? Um, maybe you took more than three attempts to pass the USMLE or the Comlex USA. Um, maybe uh, you had some issue, some ding on your license that shows up. Um, well, does that mean that you can't get medical multiple licenses? No, it doesn't. You're more than welcome to get as many licenses as you want in the United States. You would have to do it one state at a time, which is really the process today. What the Interstate Medical Licensure Compact is, is kind of a TSA pre-check that if you meet these nine criteria, the states have agreed to instantly issue you a license to practice medicine. So it's, it may not be for everyone, but it's something to be aware of. During this pandemic, we've actually seen more than 3,000 medical licenses issued by the state boards through this pathway. Overall, since the first license began to be issued through this compact only three years ago, we've seen almost 13,000 licenses issued. So clearly there's an interest among some physicians to be able to practice across state lines, uh, even above and beyond the pandemic. Um, and this is certainly something that uh, many physicians have expressed interest in. And we'll see if other states down the road will be expressing interest as well. But I wanted to make sure I mentioned that to you. Now, some of the other things we did at the Federation uh, in terms of regulation were, we worked with a group called the Coalition for physician accountability. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this organization. It's a coalition. It's uh, about 10 years old. It's made up of all of the organizations that are involved in the licensing, certification, accreditation, and assessment in the practice of medicine specifically. That's why it says Coalition for Physician Accountability. And so as soon as the pandemic was declared, uh, this coalition got together and decided to study and then issue some consensus statements on things like medical students transitioning to residency. They all agreed that, you know what, in the middle of a pandemic, it doesn't make sense to have students travel all over the country to be interviewed for residency selection. Let's 
uh, make sure that all of that is done virtually. That was something that came out of this coalition. Um, there was also a concern about students who were volunteering to help out, making sure that if they're gonna spend their time helping out, that they're getting educational credit for it, for example. Uh, this coalition pushed for changes to the ERAS deadlines. That's the Electronic Residency Application Service deadline to allow more time for medical students to be able to submit their applications for residency training. And then we also issued some guidelines on how to maintain standards and the quality and training during these quote, relaxed regulations for licensure uh, for physicians. Probably one of the most important statements we issued, and by the way, this slide lists all of the other organizations that are in the coalition. Um, there's an alphabet soup there. I don't know if you know all of them, American Medical Association, American Osteopathic Association, Council of Medical Specialty Societies, AAMC is the Association of American Medical Colleges, ACOM is the American Association of Colleges of Osteopathic Medicine, ACCME is the Accreditation Council for CME, ACGME is the Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education, ECFMG is the Educational Commission for Foreign Medical Graduates, LCME is the LC Liaison Commission on Medical Education, which accredits US MD medical schools, the National Board of Medical Examiners, and last but not least, the National Board of Osteopathic Medical Examiners, and then the FSMB is part of this as well. One of the most important statements we issued were, was on April the 9th, early on in this pandemic, we said, not only do we support strengthened efforts that must be in place to safeguard the public, that's almost obvious, but we also support protecting our nation's healthcare workforce during the COVID pandemic so they remain able to meet the public's needs. And what and this is just obviously a summary. There's a it goes into it a little more detail, which you can look up, but the, the reference there is clearly to uh, having the availability of PPE, personal protective equipment, as well as other safeguards uh, to allow healthcare workers to safely take care of those um, impacted by COVID-19. We also saw a brand new um, type of physician emerge, the COVID-19 junior physician. That's actually a title uh, that was given for graduates, in this case of the NYU Grossman School of Medicine, um, where this fourth year student graduated early. Uh, she's not yet an intern or a resident. So she's sort of in that no man's land between graduating from medical school and starting residency. And in New York State, that title was COVID-19 junior physician and we worked with the state board and the medical school and the ACGME to figure out a way that these individuals could be helpful and volunteer under supervision, of course, wanting to make sure that they weren't risking their own lives either. And as I say, there were at least uh, a dozen states or so that had uh, medical students graduate early. In fact, the state of Massachusetts, every medical school in Massachusetts had early graduation so that their graduates could help out. So where are we today? Uh, this uh, screenshot is literally from uh, this morning, November 6th, 2020, 1124 Oklahoma time. Um, the numbers don't look good. There are 40, nearly 49 million global cases of the coronavirus, uh, this particular coronavirus strain. Um, the US tops the list if you look at top left with 9.6 million cases. India is just behind with 8.4 million. Brazil is 5.6 million. By the way, this slide is from the Johns Hopkins COVID world map. Uh, it is considered authoritative by most world public health authorities, including in the US. Um, many authorities in the US are look, using this. You can look, up, look it up. They update it every few hours, actually. Uh, in terms of global deaths, uh, 1.2 million deaths thus far, 235,000 deaths in the US, 161,000 deaths in Brazil, in India, not far behind with 124,000 deaths. In terms of which states thus far have had the highest number of cases and deaths, New York tops the list because it was an early epicenter before everyone understood about the virus. 33,000 deaths, 80,000 recovered. Now, where's Oklahoma in this? Um, I scroll down to Oklahoma currently, as of today, has 132,000 positive COVID cases and 1,429 deaths, uh, a lot lower than some of the other states. So um, you all are doing something good with social distancing and keeping masks and trying to keep the numbers down. But if you look at the bottom left, 190 countries around the world have this tiny little particle that has spread so uh, far and wide. 
And so if you look at, uh, this is a graph of the United States from March the 3rd, uh, just before the pandemic was declared to uh, mid-October. So this is a few weeks old, but look at what happens to the number of cases. The, the, the blue refers to those who are currently hospitalized. The, the orange or red refers to the number of cases. So every time we in the United States saw an increase in the number of cases, look at what happened about a week and a half later, uh, we saw an increase in hospitalizations. Um, so this happened at least twice, and now we're in a third uh, sort of peak of this, where we have seen increased cases, and as you all know, we're now seeing increased um, hospitalizations uh, across the country. In some states, like in the Dakotas, their ICU capacity has been maximized now, for example. Um, so since we never went down to near zero, uh, this may be quibbling about public health terminology, um, in some circles, this is still considered part of the first wave because we never actually did come down enough as compared with Europe, which did, after some initial peaks, go down to um, not completely zero, but close to zero. And then certainly now are seeing increased cases in places like Italy, Spain, United Kingdom, France. Um, and so in Europe, they're definitely talking about a second wave I think in the United States case, you can call it a second wave if you like, but it's really still part of that first wave. Now, where is this headed? There is an Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, uh, an authoritative group uh, based in the United States, which has been looking at COVID-19 projections. Um, and this is as of October 20th, so I didn't get a chance to look at the most recent, but if current trends continue, it's possible that we could see as many as 389,000 COVID-19 deaths in the United States by February the 1st, 2021, which would meet an additional 170,000. Now, if you look at the graphic, this depends. If we um, ease up on social distancing and masks, the numbers could actually be higher. If we have more social distancing and more utilization of masks, uh, it does not have to be this number. It could be a lot less. And I think that's, if there's a hope in all this, is that something as simple as social distancing and masks could make a difference. And I think that's going to be helpful. Can it guarantee that there won't be any cases? No, uh, but it certainly can help is the prevailing public health opinion. Now, what about worldwide? Uh, this caught my eye. Um, if you look in the middle of the first paragraph, uh, this gentleman who's the executive director of the World Health Organization's Emergencies Program, uh, this is a couple of weeks ago, said that the, uh, he felt that the World Health Organization's best estimates were that roughly one in 10 people around the world have probably already been infected. Remember, um, something like 40% of people who get COVID-19 don't develop any symptoms. So with a global population of roughly 7.6 billion people, if that's the case, that will put the number of infected at more than 760 million. And you may have heard already in the news, uh, while we get 100,000 cases uh, reported each day, the actual number may be three to five times that number because those folks just don't get tested um, or, have, uh, or don't have symptoms and don't think that they need to get tested, uh, for example. So, so the numbers may actually be worse than we think they are, which is why um, you know, it's important to sort of practice social distancing as best you can. Now, of course, there is a wide age distribution. On the left-hand side are the percentage of cases. We've certainly seen higher number of cases in the uh, 25 to 29 year old population. But if you look on the number of deaths and the percentage of deaths in the United States thus far, much higher in the higher age groups. So that is certainly true. But keep in mind that it's not zero for under five. So you have heard of children. I'm sure there are pediatricians in the audience who've heard of cases or have had cases of children dying of uh, COVID-19. The numbers are smaller for this age group. Uh, but again, the virus uh, may change. There's some talk about it mutating, perhaps becoming more contagious, more infectious, perhaps becoming less fatal as well. That's actually the silver lining in this is while the numbers are going up, the latest data does show that, at least in the United States, the overall mortality tends to be trending down. Now, trending down is a relative term. Uh, the other day, we still had 1,100 deaths in one day. So trending down means it could have been worse. And, and so there's hope 
that that trend will continue. You've seen this slide many times. It's, it's a slide that's being used to uh, educate the lay people around the world about the value of masks uh, and pointing out that you could be infected and asymptomatic um, and spreading the virus. So that one way to, again, not eliminate your risk, but to lower your risk is to wear a mask. Uh, if you don't, you're potentially at maximum exposure. Doesn't mean you guarantee we'll get this virus, but certainly the risk would be higher. And many people have asked about the science behind all this. Well, early on in Lancet, which is a respected British journal, uh, this is back in uh, June the 1st, is the fine print on there. Um, they, the Lancet did a study that showed that physical distancing, face masks, eye protection, which many physicians are wearing in in-person care, all of those things lower the risk quite a bit, if you can see the numbers. But if you notice on the right-hand column, they don't go to zero. Physical distancing does not mean your risk of getting the virus goes to zero. Face masks don't mean that your risk of getting it goes to zero, but it does lower it. And since this Lancet study, there's been a number of meta-analyses uh, that looking at a number of studies that seem to clearly show value of social distancing, physical distancing, as well as face masks. Um, I'll remind you, uh, September 23rd, this is several months ago, but recently reiterated by the CDC director, Dr. Robert Redfield, um, I'll read his words because they're worth stating. And this is a message to all Americans. Face masks are the most important, powerful tool we have against COVID-19. We have clear scientific evidence that they work, so please wear one to protect yourself, your community, and your nation. Uh, and this was part of congressional testimony. Um, so this is under oath. This is not a flippant remark made at a press conference. This is during testimony before Congress. And um, that's important to keep in mind. This, uh, Dr. Redfield, of course, is the CDC director. Now at the FSMB, speaking of regulation, uh, we became aware uh, a few months ago that some state boards have been receiving complaints from patients that some physicians uh, during inpatient care have refused to wear masks. Uh, and so patients are saying, well, I'm wearing a mask. I'm trying to follow the, you know, what the guidance is. How come my doctor was not wearing a mask when I saw him or her? Um, so this prompted the FSMB to, first of all, do a study. Uh, and we did a survey of our state boards and we found that more than half of the state boards have this issue. Um, now, Lyle tells me this is not a big issue in Oklahoma, so that's good for Oklahoma, but in some states, this has been an issue. And so this prompted the FSMB on October the 6th to issue a statement saying that wearing a face covering is a harm reduction strategy to help limit the spread of COVID-19, especially uh, since physical distancing is just not possible in an in-person in healthcare setting. Now, of course, you have to follow the local guidance and the public prevailing public health guidance but if the prevailing public health guidance is to wear a face covering, that is what the state boards expect of licensees as well. Now, let me finish up uh, and then hopefully we'll have time for questions. Um, this is a slide from early on, I say early on, just a few months ago, August the 10th, 2020. In the very beginning stages of this pandemic, um, the CDC and many state and local health departments focused on how many people got the virus how many deaths were there, and didn't look beyond gender a whole lot. But at some point, um, this became a concern that maybe we should look more deeply into who actually is getting this virus, who is becoming hospitalized, who is dying from this. And so this kind of risk factor analysis um, has been going on now since August. I don't have more updated information from the CDC, but let me tell you how this works. So this is a slide from the CDC of COVID-19 hospitalization and death by age. So the comparison group is that 18 to 29 year group that you saw does not have a particularly high incidence of hospitalization. Um, but if you saw, if you're zero to four years of age, your risk of hospitalization if you got COVID-19 is four times lower than this comparison group. Your risk of death is nine times lower. Notice it's not zero. Let's look at the other end. What if you're above 85 years of age? My father lives in, um, uh, with my mother in Brooklyn, New York. He's turning 86 next month. So, uh, so he's in this category. His risk of hospitalization, should he get COVID-19, is 
13 times higher than uh, the comparison group. If he gets COVID-19 and if he gets hospitalized, his risk of death, if you look at the number from the CDC, is 630 times higher. So you can betcha that I am having daily conversations with my grandparents, with my parents rather, my children's grandparents, to make sure that uh, they are following the guidance, staying in their home unless they absolutely have to go out. Um, and I'm helping deliver, having Amazon and others deliver food for them because of something like this. Now, what about underlying medical conditions? Many of you in the audience know this already, but if you have asthma, hypertension, obesity, it just adds to those numbers that I just shared. And if you have chronic kidney disease, that actually raises your risk factor by four times. And if you have three or more of these conditions, well, multiply those numbers that I just gave you by five. That's obviously a concern. And then finally, what about different uh, demographics in terms of race and ethnicity? Well, again, this is from the CDC, same set of data. This is August the 8th, 2020. Uh, it has not budged much because I have seen some recent numbers. Um, the highest incidence of cases, hospitalizations, and deaths is actually in the Native American population. Um, this also in the African American population, uh, somewhat elevated in the Asian non-Hispanic population compared to uh, the Caucasian population. Again, something to be aware of in terms of the patients that you see in your office, there is a higher risk with certain um, categories of individuals, which by the way, leads me into my next discussion of vaccines. As you know, there are three phases to vaccine development. Uh, a lot of you have been reading this in the news and in New England Journal of Medicine or JAMA, so you know how this works, or some of you may be involved in the industry or working, have worked in the FDA. Um, Phase three is when there are hundreds or thousands of volunteers and you ask these fundamental questions, is the vaccine safe? Is the vaccine effective? That's where we are right now for a number of vaccines. Um, this is an overview of Operation Warp Speed from a colleague of mine who actually serves on that uh, task force for Operation Warp Speed. Uh, these are the leading vaccines. There are actually dozens of vaccines that are being studied all over the world. But as you can see, there are at least four that are in phase three trials. One of these four vaccines that are listed at the top four are going to become available at some point once they're truly deemed to be safe and effective. Um, the best guess is maybe by December, maybe by January. Now, if you notice, three of them involve two doses and the second dose has to be administered within 21 to 28 days. So that's gonna be a challenge. Uh, you know, sometimes it's hard enough to get people to come in to get a vaccine. You all know this with seasonal influenza every year. Now imagine trying to get people to come in for a first dose and then telling them, oh, by the way, you have to come back in 21 to 28 days for a second dose. Don't forget, otherwise um, the vaccine won't be as helpful. That's gonna be a communications, messaging and public health challenge that we will require all of you to help amplify that message. There is one of these vaccines by Janssen that's only a single dose but I'm not, no one knows right now which of these four vaccines will prevail. It could be that we have more than one vaccine. Uh, again, we're gonna have to do the best we can to educate people about it once these vaccines become available. I remind you of a statement from Dr. Fauci back in August, the chances of any COVID-19 vaccine being 98% effective are not great, which means you must never abandon the public health approach. You've got to think of a vaccine as a tool to be able to get a pandemic to no longer be a pandemic but to be something that's well controlled. Uh, in Operation Warp Speed, the goal, by the way, is to have at least 65% efficacy. That's what they're shooting for, not 100. 100 is almost impossible. So just something to keep in mind, this, we don't want people to get a false sense of security either, just because they have a vaccine, doesn't mean they can throw away their facial covering and no longer social distancing. That's gonna need to continue for several months on end. Now, vaccination can be done. There's a lot of anxiety about, well, how is this vaccine gonna be delivered? What if the doctors are all busy? Well, back in 2009, when we had the H1N1 vaccine, this you may recognize as a map of Chicago. Uh, that is Dr. Julie Morita, who is now with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, but back then was with the Chicago Health Department. And they mapped out, once that vaccine became available in November, 2009, how they were gonna deliver that vaccine. They were gonna use healthcare facilities, they were gonna use mass vaccination clinics through the local health department, 
and they were going to use retail pharmacies. I think retail pharmacies will play a big role in delivering this vaccine to the people who need it. Now, who gets it first? The National Academy of Medicine has some guidance available about the most vulnerable populations they feel should get the vaccine first. Um, I'm not sure where healthcare workers fit in, but uh, clearly there's value in healthcare workers. We did that with H1N1 in making sure that uh, in Suffolk County, our healthcare workers had access to the vaccine early on as well. Again, we'll have to see what comes out from the CDC. What's, what's gonna be key to any vaccine distribution is something that was true back in 2009, and that's coordinating H1N1 vaccine distribution. The CDC will need to get involved. State and local uh, county health departments will have to get involved, working closely with the FDA, HHS, vaccine manufacturers, insurance companies, vaccine supplies, et cetera. So I'm gonna, I think I'm almost done. I'm gonna finish up with this slide. This is from today. This is what the total daily number of cases around the world look like. This was back in March on the very left, and this is where we are today, November the 6th on the right. So when I'm asked, hey, do you think this will end anytime soon? Well, this is the graphic from that Johns Hopkins slide I showed you before. Uh, the trend is upward, not downward. So I'm afraid we're in for the long haul, at least for the next six months. Uh, vaccine will be helpful, but it's not going to bring this down precipitously. It's going to slowly bring it down, but not fast enough, which is why social distancing and face coverings are going to be important. I think this is my next to last slide, just a comparison of the different pandemics we've had. The 1918 was definitely the worst. There were 500 million cases worldwide and at least 50 million deaths. Some say as many as 100 million deaths. There were 675,000 U.S. dead. H1N1, we were lucky. Um, it was not as dangerous in terms of mortality, and we got a vaccine fairly early, which was helpful. Worldwide, they think there are actually 1.1 billion cases, estimated deaths 350,000, only 12,000 deaths in the US. What about this one? Well, we now have 7.8 billion people around the world. Um, within two days, the virus can spread all over the world. We have currently 49 million cases, 1.2 million deaths, and thus far, 235,000 deaths in the US. Uh, all of you are heroes. I'm delighted to be able to speak to you. And uh, thank you for all that you do, whether you're a scientist, doctor, nurse, first responder, public health official, uh, and those who serve on state boards. Uh, the OSMA plays an important role. And I thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak to you all. So let me stop there and happy to take any questions. Dr. Chaudhry, thank you so much for that. I know that uh, you and all of your uh, various member boards have certainly had a lot on your plate the last few months and uh, uh, really having to learn on the fly. We do have time for just a couple of questions. Uh, we have in the chat, there's uh, one, I'm gonna pose, take executive privilege and pose one of the questions we get from a lot of our members is uh, you touched on telemedicine. Uh, I, I think one of the silver linings that's gonna come out of this is it's opened a lot of people's eyes to possibilities and, and ways telemedicine can be utilized. Um, and, and frankly, I think patients you know, are, are going to expect it, are going to expect that it to be an option ongoing. So what do you see in terms of uh, changes and things that, that state boards and, and physicians need to be looking at in terms of what does telemedicine look like in a post-pandemic world? Well, I think that's a great question, Wes, and I touched on it a little bit. Uh, I think it's important for physicians who are using telemedicine right now not to get too comfortable with the device or the app that they're using, because don't forget, we're in the middle of a nationwide emergency, and a lot of uh, regulations have been relaxed. Privacy regulations have been relaxed. Uh, uh, at some point when the pandemic is over, those privacy regulations are going to come back online. So you may not be able to use uh, texting or Skype to be able to practice medicine for, for one thing. Uh, secondly, I think there is a realization that telemedicine is more than just what it had been, which was episodic care for if you had a specific issue. It may actually be more than that. It might actually supplement the care that physicians have long uh, delivered in person. And so I think that's going to need to be studied and looked at. Um, so the good news is the regulators are studying this. They are aware that there's been greater utilization and we're going to try to do the right thing and give you guidance so that you can deliver care the way uh, that you can safely. But remember, telemedicine, as you all know, is not for every condition. Thank you. A um, couple of other quick questions. Uh, in this, some of this may be too early to tell in, in terms of the, uh, the vaccine trials. Is there any indication that uh, any of those that they're working on right now 
would provide any sort of immunity for uh, non SARS-CoV-2 as well, or is, is, are we looking at uh, something completely different? Well, that's a great question in terms of cross reactivity. Um, you know, it reminds me back in 2009 when we had the H1N1 influenza, we knew it was a type of an influenza virus. And so we pushed people to get seasonal influenza even before the H1N1 influenza vi virus uh, vaccine became available because we thought there might be some cr cross reactivity and there was. So right now, the big concern is obviously with this particular strain of coronavirus and the vaccine is obviously going to be geared towards that vaccine. We don't have data yet because we don't know which of these vaccines are gonna advance, uh, but uh, one of the information pieces that you should all be looking for is how long does that immunity last? The prevailing opinion, by the way, for many epidemiologists and public health officials is that this is not gonna be one of those things where you get a vaccine and you're good to go for 10 years. This is not gonna be like a tetanus shot. It may actually be like a seasonal influenza shot, which means possibly uh, every year, just like you get a flu shot, you may have to remind yourself and your patients to get an annual coronavirus vaccine as well. Uh, because most of the studies don't show prolonged immunity beyond several months. But then again, we haven't even started giving the vaccine yet. So it'll require some studying. But um, you know, pay attention to what they tell you once we know which of the vaccines are going to be moving forward. Uh, thank you. Just a couple final questions. And just for everybody on the chat, I'll just, uh, as a reminder, if you look in the chat, the information has been posted there about where to go get your, uh, uh, the CME credit, as well as copies of this presentation. Uh, it's on our website at okmed.org. Um, just real quickly, the, uh, I lost my place here. I apologize. Uh, the question came up about uh, the emergency certifications, the emergency license thing that was done early on in the, in the uh, COVID thing. Question was, if licenses from other states are given in an emergency, then why can't we just do that all the time? So uh, can you kind of talk about maybe, sort, I guess, sort of the difference between what has been happening in terms of emergency licensing, as opposed to say how the interstate licensure compact works, things of that nature? Well, that's a great question. And this goes back to, this requires a slightly longer answer. And um, you know, from the state board's point of view, State medical boards have been around since essentially the nation was founded. When the nation was founded, there were colonial boards of medicine. And so the practice of medicine was only always done at a local level. And so the state boards under the 10th amendment to the constitution, um, they license and regulate doctors. Um, and so when the practice of medicine goes wonderfully, that's great. But their primary mission of the state medical board is to protect the public. And when something goes wrong, as it sometimes does, there needs to be a means and a mechanism to figure out what went wrong. Was it a random error? Was it a systematic error? Was there an issue related to something greater that needs to be looked into? Um, so the state boards um, have been very flexible and accommodating as you've seen in this national emergency. The Interstate Medical Licensure Compact is another means by which states like Oklahoma and the Oklahoma Medical Board and the Osteopathic Board have demonstrated flexibility in being accommodating to allow physicians to practice medicine safely, but the state boards at the end of the day, um, uh, and this is in the state statutes of every single state in the union, must have recourse and, and an ability to investigate when something doesn't go the way that it should. Otherwise, you know, anybody can call themselves a doctor and practice medicine, which is not any, what anyone wants in the practice of medicine. So um, we're flexible. We're working with uh, Lyle and other executive directors around the country uh, to make this work and trying to see what we may be able to put in place after the pandemic as well. Thank you. Uh, we'll make this the last question and I'm gonna paraphrase because it's a little bit of a sensitive subject, but just as all this has gone on, there's been a lot of uh, discussion on, you know, what really is effective. You think about, you know, placanil, hydroxychloroquine, all these different things that, uh, you know, you can find physicians saying a whole host of things about these things. What advice are you giving your boards? Because it, it's going to happen where, where pay, there's going to be complaints filed against physicians because they did or didn't do a certain kind of treatment that somebody heard about on the news or things of that nature. Um, what are you telling your member boards on how to prepare for and how to you know, look into those sort of issues? Wes, that's an outstanding question. I'm so glad that uh, you posed that because we have seen issues and I'm sure you all have you know, the state boards of medicine uh, and osteopathic medicine um, allow a lot of leeway for the practice of medicine. 
because we recognize that when a physician is licensed to practice medicine, that they have earned the, their qualifications through education and training to practice medicine. And so there's a lot of leeway, if you will. That said, especially in a dynamic situation like this, it is absolutely critical for physicians to keep up to date with the literature, especially as it relates to COVID-19, it's changing constantly. Um, so while it may be permissible under certain circumstances to use certain medications or treatments to treat certain conditions, you gotta make sure that it's, based, it's backed up with evidence and science to do so. Um, and I think that's something that is sometimes forgotten. What I recommend to doctors is there is an NIH, National Institute of Health, expert panel that has been updating, and you can go to the NIH website and find it. It's a COVID-19 expert panel made up of physicians from the American College of Physicians, American College of Chest Physicians, AMA, AOA, uh, CDC, FDA, all the experts are there. They look at all the literature because they know that busy doctors don't have time for that and use that as a guide to make your decisions. One thing that I will mention, Wes, as a closing comment, that the state boards have an issue with is people promising cures from any treatment or um, medication they may use. We just don't do that in medicine. We, and I think we've seen some of that. And when that's happened, the state boards have uh, stepped in to uh, caution doctors that we don't promise cures. Uh, but we can certainly allow some leeway in the management, but please follow the science, follow the evidence. You don't have to read the journals yourself go to the NIH expert panel guideline. So, well, thank you so much. I think this was all very informative. We uh, pre certainly appreciate you being on here. Uh, Lyle, thank you so much for all that you do. Again, thank you to the State Board of Medical Licensure and to Plyco for sponsoring today and making this possible. Uh, again, if, for those of you on the panel, or excuse me, on the uh, uh, watching the YouTube stream, if you look in the chat, you'll see the information there on where to get your CME credit. If you have any questions or problems, please contact Sandy Deba at the OSMA office. So with that, again, thank you, Dr. Chaudhry. Thank you, Lyle. And we appreciate you all being here and look forward to seeing you on our next CME presentation. Thank you and stay safe, everyone.